Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Horasis panel on reconceiving work and play post-COVID. I'm Lou Marinoff, professor of philosophy at the City College of New York, longtime Horasis faculty and, ch- and panel chair. Uh, we have some really interesting participants tonight on the panel. I'll introduce two of the three. We're hoping the third will make it into the room. Uh, but uh, on my right uh, is uh, Kiran Sethi, Chief Executive Officer of Jupiter International Corporation. And Kiran is based in Japan and speaks Japanese, so, I, uh, so I've learned. And uh, the the other participant in the room is Jim Yuan, who is a co-founder and partner of Joyview Education, uh, based more or less in China, but you, of course, are further reaching than this, yes? Uh, yeah. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome both of you. Just let me, before I turn things over to you, just set this up uh, for participants. There are a couple of participants in the room, and we'll give them a chance to jump in later and invite their questions or comments to you. But the rapid positioning of, uh, of office work into the home has disrupted all kinds of enterprises. Uh, But we're social creatures and casual chat with colleagues and informal things that happen in the office also enhance innovation and well-being. So there's no doubt that even though people can telecommunicate effectively on platforms, uh, there there is still something happening in the social equation that's been disrupted. Uh, We're not going to talk about politics tonight, but we know that politically um, and economically and socially and psychologically and in other ways, this little virus has truly uh, disrupted the global village and has put uh, us on a different track. Uh, being adaptive creatures that we are, uh, and sometimes being clever, we'll probably find a way, hopefully, to surmount these difficulties. But meanwhile, I would like to open, uh, I'll invite you, Kiran, first, uh, and then Jim, to tell us uh, how, it, from the beginning of COVID, it's almost two years now, more or less, how has this affected your sector, you personally, in your business, and your sector? Um, and how, what kinds of adjustments have you made and have they really been optimal, uh, you know, in your terms? And we'll start with the workplace. We can get to play later. Okay. Over to you, Kiran, please. Thank you very much. My name is Kiran Sethi. I'm based in Kobe, Japan. I believe we have some listeners in the Japan also. Um, I could do this in Japanese too, but be unfortunate for the other participants, <laughs> maybe, but uh, we'll, we'll stick to English. Um, uh, I, I can speak about Japan, I can speak about my experiences, but I remember my, my first encounter with the COVID crisis was when I was traveling in Seoul. I was in Seoul, and I don't know if you recall or if you've heard of um, the, the spread of COVID in Seoul. It was started at a church, and that became big news in Seoul two years ago. And I arrived in Seoul that morning when that news came out, and I had appointments from 10 in the morning uh, all the way till the afternoon, and I'm getting, I'm on my cab on the way to the appointments, and I'm getting emails left and right and calls left and right, everybody canceling on me. I just arrived off the airport, I'm on the way, and I, I'm, in, I'm in people's offices, they just won't meet me. I'm in, I'm in their lobby, they won't come down, just because the COVID hit so hard, and I guess the uh, Koreans and some of the, uh, the the Chinese and the Taiwanese people have experienced uh, um, other infectious diseases, and SARS in the past. So they're very quick to react. Um, I saw people sanitizing buildings right away in Seoul. Um, uh, people were masking up. In fact, there were signs on the streets saying, if you don't mask up, don't come in to that city. Mm-hmm. Um, so people were reacting very fast. And I was very, very surprised. And I, was, I never was involved in an infection environment like this in the past. So I was wondering, I thought it was in a different world. I thought it was in a movie or something. Well, you were really in a different awful. world. You were in a science fiction movie. But tell us about your business, please, and how then this has impacted, uh, you know, what you, what you actually do when you are meeting people one way or another. Right. So, so with, that, with that in the, in the background, the initial, um, I, I, we were surprised at how the businesses were affected. People in Japan, it took a little while for them to uh, understand the gravity of the infection and how fast it could spread. Um, and obviously, the uh, policies did come in where people were encouraged to work from home, um, were encouraged to work from home, um, uh, stay away from workplaces, obviously avoid restaurants, obviously avoid crowded places. 
But a country like Japan, the transportation and people commute primarily by train. So people were living in fear because one, from being infected, two, from not knowing what the infection is actually all about because there weren't so many serious cases in the beginning. But people, people were normally it, masked anyway, right? I mean, in Japan, people have, have almost always been masked. So wasn't that a, a, a perhaps for them a more natural thing than for many other cultures which never wore masks, really? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, my staff, my, my staff are masked um, most of the winter because of influenza or other diseases. And I was never masked. So I had to put on a mask uh, and, and everybody masked up very fast, which, again, caused um, shortages of PP uh, protective pro- protective mm-hmm. products, masks mm-hmm. also. Uh, we we actually, as a trade, handle masks too. We import them. We weren't able to get product. And if we were, we we're paying 10 times the price, just like anybody in the world. So sure. so all that I think is similar to everybody experience uh, uh, around the world. Um, however, maybe a little unique over here is uh, um, when when people telework as they call it, work from home, not avoid the office. Um, a lot of the Japanese people who are in larger companies were told not to come to the office. However, um, I don't know if you know, but some of the Japanese homes are fairly small. So it's very hard when you have two children in a three bedroom place, you got one child in one room doing their homework and doing schoolwork, another child, and you got the mom taking over the living room, the kitchen, the husband has no place to work. So they have to find, there were, in fact, there are opportunities with real estate. Um, there are a lot of offices, small offices that opened up, uh, remote offices, and that business started picking up. Um, but on the other hand, uh, p- so people would actually leave the, leave the home. They won't go to work. They'll maybe, maybe be at coffee shops if they're open. But if not, they'll find offices that are remote, which, are, which is um, uh, COVID protocol uh, issued or pro- COVID protocol in- installed, and they would work there. Um, and that's something that we saw. Uh, obviously, everybody took care of the environment. They, they, they did whatever pro- protocols necessary, masking, uh, cleaning, keeping windows open, air, doors open, airs, air, air, air flowing very well. But again, uh, people got used to that. And um, the Japanese culture is very hygienic. So the hygienic n- nature of them allowed this to allowed this culture to, uh, I think, adapt very easily and fairly quickly. Okay, but, let me ask you about, just before we, we turn to Jim, just about the broader picture. You were involved with supply chains, are you not? Yes. That's what Jupiter yes. does? So it's ironic that you had problems with your own masks supply, uh, although this is something you would normally be supplying for others. Uh, what broader impacts have there been in uh, your uh, world with the supply chains in general? Well, I mean, the, the, the supply chain problem actually happened maybe not even in the first year. It actually started kicking in in the second year. The first year, people were still adapting. The demand came down. People were consuming less. There was less consumption. If consumption of only necessities were increasing, and I think this might be so. This might be a phenomenon around the world. Um, however, as time came by, people were consuming less. They're staying at home more. They're spending less. So at the end of the day, their their con- ability to consume or the consumption and savings have gone up. So the trend I saw second year around is people were spending a lot of money on luxury luxury items. Of course, people continue to spend on necessities. But um, I remember we, we, we also handle some luxury items. Uh, and, and an example is I, I heard uh, someone going to a Cartier shop or, or a branded shop, and they would maybe budget $5,000 $5, for a watch. But these people were spending eight ten thousand $10,000 because they had money saved up and they wanted to reward themselves for suffering through the COVID period when they were locked in the locked so, in so one is area. that for you the, the the main explanation of these backlogs in the supply chain is it demand uh, out, outpacing supply in general is that your view of this? No, the, the supply chain issue is a totally separate issue. It does it, there is a big cause from COVID, and that's because workers couldn't go to work, 
And I, okay. I'll give an example of Long Beach. And right, I'm going to USA. ask you, well, give, hold on to that. Okay, I want okay. To, to go over now to Jim. Jim, co-founder and partner of Joyview Education. And uh, so please tell us about your sector and about the immediate uh, adjustments you've had to make to the disruption. Sure. I'll, I'll try to uh, first just give a little bit of introduction of, of Joyview and what we do, and then um, go through, uh, try to answer your question from three areas, operations, clientele, and mobility, these three uh, areas. So Joyview Education is a, um, is a is an education consulting and project-based learning um, firm. Um, we're based in, uh, headquartered in Beijing. We have a presence in Shanghai um, as well. Um, although I'm personally uh, based in, in Manila, Philippines. I'm in this weird situation where I'm a foreigner living in one country, but the business is headquartered in a very different country. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, so back to Joyview, the, the Joyview um, has uh, partnerships and uh, relations with uh, different organizations, NGOs, uh, startups, uh, social enterprises, in which uh, we help the students to um, have uh, projects-based learning and other opportunities beyond their uh, schoolwork. Uh, for example, recently we have a, a partnership with a company in India, a social enterprise in India that works in the farming sector, and we have a group of students that are working as online interns for uh, for uh, for this, uh, volunteering as online interns for this uh, Indian inter in social enterprise. We also have a partnership with the UNESCO Center for Peace, um, and, uh, which like, organizes Model United Nations and other um, other events. And uh, part of our, our, our um, mission is to really develop more compassion of future uh, global citizens for this world and really helping students um, really see the world um, beyond what people actually see. In well, so how has COVID, COVID disrupted this and how have you adjusted? I think uh, three areas. Uh, so going back to 2020, uh, I'll go with first with operations. So when COVID first started, uh, if we look at the slew of um, education companies that are based in, um, in Beijing, um, and, and there is this one um, one road in Beijing called Chuchun Lu. It's one road uh, in the Haidian district in Beijing. Haidian is kind of like the Silicon Valley district. It's a combination of like Silicon Valley and um, Harvard and MIT. because it, it kind of houses the two top universities in China, Beida, Beijing University and Tsinghua University. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the education-based firms are kind of just lined up along that street. And the word on the street is that 50% of them die within the first... Uh, two or three months. And, uh, and one of the lessons learned, I think, from that is, is having, you know, having cash flow is important for the operations. You know, the, the, there was like a sudden disruption because you know, back in the early 2020, uh, the, the response to the COVID was very drastic. So no one could actually go out of their, you know, their houses or apartments. And so a lot of these companies, they couldn't do any business development. And that sudden disruption resulted in a, a major exodus in terms of the workforce. It arguably resulted in almost 50% of the companies just um, not being able to survive. So and, what, was the key, the, what was the key to the ones who survived? Is there a common denominator? I would argue that uh, cash flow is of having very positive cash flow to really sustain that difficult period of uh, initial couple months is very important. It's, it's very important. And also the, the, the thing is it coincided in the, if we think back to the early 2020, it also, that period coincided with the traditional um, supply and demand uh, shuffle in the labor force as well. So, so every year within mainland China, around February, around the Lunar New Year's time, it's a typical uh, uh, Lunar New Year and March timeframe. It's a typical time frame basically for people to reshuffle for, for hiring and rehiring and firing, et cetera. So it's unfortunate that that also came within that, that, that COVID disruption came within that period. So a combination of, um, of workforce volatility as well as uh, just not having enough cash flow arguably has uh, been disruptive to some companies. I and mean, luckily we survived and we were able to actually thrive uh, afterwards. But it was initial couple of months were very tough. But then, you know, things got in order I think that the, um, there were a lot of uh, restrictions that were put in place, resulting in a much earlier recovery than uh, they originally had, had anticipated. So, that, so okay. first area is uh, operations around, you know, I think the lessons learned was having enough cash flow for a company to really, you know, 
it's inevitable that you know companies are going to go through periods of disruption. That's that those are things that we cannot control. That not anyone can control. That's way beyond our control. But what we can do is to hold enough cash to be able to survive those initial months of disruption where nothing's coming in. Right. Understood. I'd like to just welcome uh, our other guests in the room, uh, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Wood, and uh, welcome uh, Edgar Bulliser, my, my friend from many meetings. Welcome. Nice to see you. Tadehiro uh, Kawada-san, uh, thank you for coming. And Professor Aditya Singh as well. We will throw the floor open to you momentarily. We have a half hour left. So I want to go back to the panelists now and ask them in turn, what is their vision of uh, going forward? We're talking supposedly about reconceiving work also post-COVID. Well, we're not post-COVID yet, uh, but do you foresee uh, that we will? And in that process of moving beyond COVID, hopefully soon, how will work continue to change? Please, back to you uh, to begin, Kiran. Okay, let me let me talk a little bit about the business side of uh, um, my experience, uh, which I skipped earlier. Um, basically, the the success stories and the failing stories, um, like like uh, Jim said earlier, is related to cash flow. Um, and, but again, it's also related to demand. So wherever their supply was allowed, whereas distribution was allowed, for example, restaurants that are open, restaurants that were closed. Um, Department stores that were open, department stores that was closed. Obviously, the closed ones had challenges, but the government did help. So the smaller retailers, for example, a one-man shop or one-man restaurant, they got lots of government help. They did very, very well. In fact, some of them made more than they would have ever made uh, if, there, if there was no COVID. Um, whereas if you were a medium class, well, this could be retail or restaurant even, you had a lot of challenges because you couldn't, Keep up, you can keep up with the fixed expenses, um, although you can keep the uh, um, flexible expenses down, the fixed expenses could not be controlled. Now, if you're on the higher end and you have your mass market, you are able to manage the entire business operations so you survive. And not only that, you usually had access to cash flow, so you can always go out and borrow or you can always go out and uh, get more funds. So. The middle guys were the real ones who had a tough time. Now, in my business, we do uh, consumer product distribution. So the Uniqlo's or the um, uh, the lower end retailers, whether it be apparel or any uh, fashion items, did very well. The middle tier, the department store people, suffered. I think some of them sales may have gone down by ninety percent, eighty percent. Maybe it's. In, I don't. I don't even think it's today. It's back up to a hundred percent. And the upper tier guys, the Hermes and the Cartiers, no. I mean, they figured out how to change your distribution mechanism going to e-commerce very, very fast. I mean, I don't know how well they did per numbers, but they shifted very fast. So yeah. the ones who were able to shift the business models, their distribution mechanism did very well. The ones who weren't able to um, is probably either taken over or disappeared from the market. Uh, there are a lot of stores that are just not open anymore. Uh, but on the other hand, the stronger ones who won are taking over that store spot. So you see that trend going on. So there's basically there's a realignment within each industry of the survivors and the non-survivors. Right. That's, the, that's, that's well basic. stated. It, it, it seems a little bit at times analogous to biological evolution. It's not the same, but cultural evolution mimics some of the aspects of it. So we have mass extinctions in the past, and here we've had arguably something that's kindred to a mass extinction of businesses. And if you're either too big to fail, you succeed. Or if you're too small, that becomes a virtue, doesn't it? Because a lot of community businesses have survived because the people in the actual locale have pulled together with them, haven't traveled. And so uh, it's like the dinosaurs, you know, these large animals went extinct, but some very small mammals survived quite handily. Uh, it's a little bit similar to that, but you sound optimistic. Let, let's get uh, Jim's view of this. How, how are things going to change going forward? What, what, what do you see as the trends uh, as we hopefully reach post-COVID? I think um, I want to perhaps uh, make a comment at large because the 
What is happening within mainland China, uh, it's a little bit different given the early recoveries. So, the, so beyond this initial shakeoff phase, there hasn't been arguably all that much impact of COVID beyond the, you know, the initial dying off because the, 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 the country as a whole has recovered from COVID quite quickly. Um, but the, I think the, the, they're still going through this zero tolerance policy in terms of COVID. So, so in order for you to go around anywhere, from city to city, town to town, you have to have this green code. And if you don't have a green code, automatic quarantine for X amount of days, no zero tolerance. And they, they actually put like a, was it the, the, the doors are actually sealed off and when, when you are under, under these quarantines and very, very, very uh, strict measures. Um, and a lot of that is, is arguably for the public good as well. So I, I don't want to go into a policy debate, but overall for businesses, um, as far as COVID is concerned, there hasn't been... Um, as much of an impact beyond those initial uh, couple of months. And then the, I think the, for the education sector over there, the bigger impact recently has been what's so-called the dual, um, I don't know how to, how to translate it in English, but dual cuts, where there has been the policy of, um, of uh, reductions, or it's called dual reductions, reductions within the K-12 sectors. So that, um, you know, the, so that the, the after-school tutoring is going back to the schools systems themselves. And that has resulted in a major shakeup. Arguably what uh, building what Lou and, and what Kieran is saying, this whole um, extinction event, that has shaken up the, that sector industry quite a lot um, over the past months. We are not affected because we don't do, we actually don't do the traditional K-12 stuff. So we're not, we have not much impact, but we have seen around this whole, um, again, traditional this whole area, many other companies being affected, especially the ones who are, let's say, if you are product is a if you're ed, ed tech company that uh, has a product in which you are um, marketing um, online K to twelve math tutoring materials, or if you if you have like a geography tutoring for uh, K to twelve, that is a huge. It's basically extinction um, as far as that um, that goes. So so um, going forward. Uh, you know, for, for in terms of the dual reductions of K to twelve, there's not much you can do because that's central policy. It's just I think a lot of companies like New Oriental, for example, it's one of the most famous uh, companies within that sector. New Oriental has now gone to other fields such as um, adult learning. So so they, they've uncovered a new uh, a new uh, ocean. It's not that that blue to be honest, but but it's you know a very large ocean with a lot of demand for lifelong learning. And New Oriental has, um, has dived in, you know, going from the K to 12 to um, helping adults to, uh, to learn and become lifelong learners. And, and there you, you see a lot of these companies, they're jumping into adjacent sectors that kind of leverages their core competency in terms of teaching education, but uh, changing up the demand and the, um, the, 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 the clientele base uh, from the K to 12 into other perspective areas. Absolutely. And since we're, and I'm in that sector, obviously education, higher education, but because it's a service as opposed to a good, uh, what we find is more malleability and the paradigms have totally been shaken up and educational institutions are definitely failing if they're too rigid. Uh, but we're looking at some very interesting futures. I would like to uh, in, invite our two stalwart uh, guests in the room, Catherine and Edgar, to, to participate. You've been very patient, and we do have time. We have two really interesting panelists. So first, uh, Catherine, please introduce yourself and uh, and then either make a comment or pose a question to uh, to one of our, to both the panelists, if you like. Go right ahead. Okay, go ahead. I think I've given you the mic, hopefully. Or not. Can you hear me? Oh, there you, you are. Me. Great. Um, thank you, guys. Yeah, really interesting to hear your stories. Um, I'm based in Singapore. Um, I'm British, but I've been living here for 12 years. Um, and I, I run my own SME, actually. I'm a business owner. So I, I've been really interested to hear about how um, it affected you guys operationally or, or within um, your teams as well. Now, my area is actually HR and um, and talent. So I was quite interested to hear what your thoughts would be on um, 
the play aspect, work and play when it comes to this topic. So we've, we've spoken a fair bit more about work. Um, how do you see play fitting into the topic of work? Um, and, you know, why, why is it aligned together in, in the title of this, um, of this session? I'd, I'd love to hear some thoughts on that. Great, great. Well, uh, let's let's give both panelists a chance to respond, and uh, we'll start again with Kiran. If uh, if you could talk to us about play in Japan, that would be really interesting. And then over to you, Jim. Please, Kiran. Yeah, well, like I mean, like I mentioned earlier, going back to people having the opportunity to save money during COVID, when COVID settling, COVID's pretty much settling down right now in Japan. Maybe we've got hundred cases a day all over Japan with one hundred twenty million people. So that's probably less less accidents that happen in a car. But anyway, so those people who've saved money, teachers, public servants, um, are actually going out and trying to get healthy. They would go out and maybe they'll, they'll start a new gym. They'll go for an aesthetic salon, which is phenomenal, maybe $2,000, to treat themselves to something good. So that's the play side. The work side was... They, they suffered. They had to work from home. They had to have challenging times. They don't have big homes like everybody has in most of North America or other parts of the world. People are living in smaller, cozier places. Um, but I hear two sides of it. You either, if you're a couple and you're, you're your husband and wife, you either became very close or you really got cracks among themselves. Um, I don't know if it's a personality thing or if it's a, if it's a COVID thing. But I hear both sides of the story. Well, that's again, a different kind of game, Kieran. Relationships, you know, a different a different dimension. But let me back to the play that Catherine is bringing up. How, what about the internet? Obviously, internet gaming has probably taken off. Uh, I'm just guessing. I don't do that, but uh, in Japan, that's been a, a leading edge phenomenon for years. So, have you noticed th- that people are spending more time online playing, for example? Well, I don't know about games, but I can say the e-commerce business has shot up and it's it's fed up. Um, e-commerce is lagging behind in Japan from the UK or US or even China, uh, way behind. Uh, but that's just caught up phenomenally. But again, going back to um, uh, Catherine, your question on HR. Um, in Japan, most employees are very loyal in Japan. So labor mobility is somewhat less than we see in the US. Now, all that said, I'm American and I have kids and I have family in the U.S. I mean, people are moving, uh, especially in the IT sector. Um, they're, they're looking for jobs left and right, and they're finding them, and they're getting promotions. And on the corporate side, they're they're working really hard to avoid losing employees. Um, and and I, I hear a study some. I heard a st- about a study somewhere losing one employee and bringing someone in costs the company nine months worth of salary just to get the person back on board to where the previous level is. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, in Japan, we don't see that much of it. But but when you're sitting at home or you're sitting alone working uh, outside the office, people have a lot more time to think about their future. Okay. Thank you very much. Jim, how, what's your perspective on Catherine's question? How about th- playing China? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I'd like to actually, if, if you, I may answer this from a different angle from the Philippines, where I'm in right now as opposed to China. Uh, and I'm going to take off the education hat and put on my digital nomad slash uh, techie hat. Uh, and, and I want to answer this question from two areas. One, uh, this concept called play to earn, which I see a lot in here in the Philippines. And now second, uh, in terms of decentralized autonomous organizations. Um, and I'm in some of these communities where we talk about DAOs a lot. Uh, so first, in terms of play to earn, I'm, in the, I'm physically in the Philippines right now, and I see a lot of people, especially young people, um, instead of uh, taking on work, they basically now engage in what's called work to uh, uh, play to earn. And you literally have these blockchain-based, uh, crypto-based games in which you can play these games and earn tokens. That um, you know, here in the Philippines, um, given the the standard of uh, of uh, of salaries, which are actually quite low by Western standards, or even by by Singapore standards, they're they're quite low. So. The, uh, and that's an average entry level white collar employee earns up to. Uh, I mean, I, I'm also from the U.S. Uh, as well, so I use U.S. dollar terms uh, in terms of uh, let's say you know 300, 400, 500 USD a month max, like like tops. If you're a, a, a recent college grad, and that's really good. If you're in, in like the business districts in here in Manila, um, that's really uh, that's really good. But but the 
I, I've surveyed like a couple of folks who are like, doing this work to uh, this earn play to earn scheme, and on average, it seems like if you spend two hours per day playing this game called Axel Infinity, which is very popular in the Philippines, uh, to the point where the government actually stepped in and said, "Hey, you know, we want to tax this." Um, you know, the, the the there's and then the the it's so popular that um, you know, every every new college grad probably is playing this game uh, somewhere. And, uh, and for Excellent Spin, you can play this for two hours per day and earn up to 18,000 Philippine pesos, which is equivalent to almost like uh, uh, 18,000, it's equivalent to almost $400, which is almost, not quite, but almost the level of a monthly, a monthly uh, entry-level white-collar salary here. So you know, between having to work for eight hours a day and be stuck in you know, traffic and other things versus having you know, playing this for two hours, a lot of people are choosing the latter. So, so there, you can see it, like, almost like a paradigm shift of the, uh, like a, a mixing of work and play. And yeah. what is work and what is play? And uh, for, for a lot of folks, um, especially some of the younger generations, the, 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 there is no difference between work and, and play. And, in, in mm, I think that's um, just to slightly just interrupt very quickly, but I think that is incredibly important thing to realise for corporates and for those who are planning to bring on graduates and have graduate training programmes and like invest in um, a, a length of time. Um, uh, people working for them for a length of time is that's what they're competing against, it, you know. I'm oh. sorry. I, 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 yes, I, I muted Jim because there was some interference, and I've invited sorry. him to respond to you briefly. Go ahead, Jim. So, so I, I, absolutely. And, and if you, if if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, steer the conversation a little bit towards Al's, um since Catherine, you're in HR, and one of the a lot of the the, the tech communities I, I'm in, uh, outside of the the education uh, hub, uh, we talk a lot about decentralized autonomous organizations, and it's a new trend arguably that's been swinging up and it does have um, some impact on the HR sector where um, I think you know, traditionally H you have H you know, HR companies that um, you know, actually recruit people uh, and you, know, you go through the, the traditional process but we're seeing this new phenomenon called the decentralized autonomous organizations that's um, much more decentralized and much more community based where it's not so much about how does my resume fit into you know your company per se but People just you know start joining a community and then just contributing to the communities and there uh, within these DAOs there are what's so called like bounties where let's say you have different tax tasks that are that are um, managed and that are that are uh, posted and if you perform certain tasks you are rewarded with a certain number of uh, of tokens some of these things can be like uh, stipulated by smart contracts and. Uh, you don't have a like a CEO or a CMO or CFO per se. You're not hiring for a C level or a manager. Uh, it is a lot of this really just self-regulated and uh, organic per se. And you, right. you have these DAOs that are amounting to 10,000, 20,000 people and very sprawling and dynamic. And, and uh, there's the saying that the some of the DAOs are becoming the new LLCs of the, of this era, although you know the jury is still out in terms of how effective these can be, and there are obviously going to be probably some issues with these DAOs as well. So, but there are a um, arguably a trending phenomenon, and arguably the pandemic has accelerated this path because of the um, the remote work, the uh, need for more decentralized workplaces and workforces. So you can have literally you know someone from the UK, someone from Singapore, someone from Japan. You know, be in the same DAO and contribute to the same um, organization wherever you are. Again, that's a brilliant insight because we, we are seeing what amounts to new speciation. We're seeing the, the Internet permits a seamless integration, almost of all kinds of people and tasks that may have formerly been disparate. So we have these new creatures that emerge uh, and and could indeed flourish. So a very interesting observation. Uh, could I introduce Edgar to you? Edgar, please uh, jump in uh, and uh, welcome to uh, to our panel. Uh, I'm going to try and give you the mic. I think you're still there. Uh, so kindly join us and uh, tell us where you are. If you're in Malaysia, say so. We'd like to hear from you and pose your question to the panelists, please. Here he is. Are you there? In 
invite on stage, okay, they didn't train me to do all these things. Usually in Zoom, someone just talks. But here we go. Edgar, how nice to see you. Hi, everyone. Hello, uh, great hello. To see you all. Uh, hello from the Philippines. I was preparing to share about Philippines, but glad to hear Jim do so. And I fully agree with him. Uh, but I don't know, Jim, if you're in Manila. I'm in Manila, uh, yes. yes. Yeah, sir. so let me share something that's down south in Mindanao. And uh, again, agreeing with you, the techie generation are enjoying or not missing a lot, my, whether they be my children or grandchildren. I have uh, a 17-year-old grand, grand, uh, granddaughter and, uh, well, three of them. The youngest already has her own gadget and enjoying it. And like you said, uh, talking about cryptocurrency, investing in Bitcoin or uh, Ethereum. I was just surprised. I mean, they're so young and that. Uh, uh -huh. teaching me all these things. But what I'm going to share is from the countryside because uh, as Lou may remember, I shared with him that uh, in Pastor Reyes' events that uh, uh, I belong to agriculture, commercial agriculture. So if you guys eat uh, a banana, remember the farmers like me who grow them. So we pack for the Chiquita brand and uh, and other, other brands also locally. Uh, the pandemic didn't have uh, much effect. In so far as the day-to-day -day lives of the farm workers are concerned, or the rural workers in the rural communities, um, our companies stopped operation because of the effect of the pandemic to a certain extent. But we hope to resume shortly, hopefully by early part of next year. That's easily 10,000 people who lost their jobs. But what's interesting is uh, it shows our capacity to survive. Uh, I haven't heard of anyone who died of hunger. Maybe because uh, the Asian culture has that strong sense of community, the family, and even to the spirituality. You know, we just pray to God if they have nothing to eat, and we seem to be okay. Just drink water, or as they say, eat grass. It's more healthy. So the, whether that grass is called kamote tops or moringa, that kind of thing. So, yeah, anyway, thanks, Jim, for sharing about the Philippines. But um, uh, insofar as the the countryside is concerned, in fact, wearing masks is uh, not practiced. Of course, we when there's uh, the, the local government officials, the, our guys in the farm would put on their mask out of respect. Uh -huh. But as soon as the inspectors have left, then they just go back to enjoy the fresh air again. And uh, wisely so, maybe, because... They're not so, they're, to say that they're socially or physically distanced is an understatement. The population density in the farms is maybe maximum five people for every hectare. So why, why be uh, restrained of fresh air when they can enjoy it openly? So anyway, just a bit of uh, sharing from, from this side of the Philippines. It's so, very important, uh, Edgar, that you mentioned the rural lifestyle. Uh, in the yes. agricultural context or indeed any other, you know that in 2009, we crossed the Rubicon as a species in that there were more people for the first time in history living in cities than in the countryside. 2009. Right. And, and right. there's been conspicuous efforts in some large cases to move more people to the cities or to the suburbs and away. Uh, so we, but we must never forget the contributions of the agricultural sector. As you say, uh, we, we may not have everything on Amazon that people want shipped tomorrow, but we still have fruits and vegetables and, and we have local produce as well in our supermarkets that come from our local farming communities. Uh, they're the backbone in a sense of, of that very long lived way of life, are they not? And, uh, it's Thank good you, to know that. Yeah, thank yeah, you. And I agree with, yeah, uh, thank you. I agree with you 100%. And by the way, let me just say also that you've got a great panel. The two guys represent easily what? One third, one fourth of the world's population between <laughs> India and China. Yeah, they cover a yeah, lot of ground. Yeah. They cover a lot of ground. And we had, yeah. the, and the third, the third gentleman was not able to connect, but we would have had more like uh, three quarters if he had. Uh, let me just say this. We've got six minutes. Uh, could, could each of you uh, give us a takeaway, including Edgar? You'll get the last word. Uh, you're probably our resident elder. I'm not sure. It's really great seeing you again. I think it was Vietnam last time we met. Seems like yes. an eternity ago, but it was just could a couple of years. 
Uh, yes. But in any case, could we just give, uh, for the benefit of those who are still with us, Catherine still is, and for everyone concerned, and for those who will view this on YouTube at some point. So, uh, Kiran, could you just give us your uh, one-minute takeaway? What, what can we really carry forward uh, from this meeting uh, into uh, a more optimistic future? Well, I think, um, as everybody knows, COVID was a disruption. However, it was a disruption in, in, a, in a moment of re, realigning yourself. And I think it's a moment to re, revisit your true values, whether it be corporate, personal, community, or culture. And, and I think going forward, those values are the ones that help you grow and succeed. Um, I think there's only one way that this result is gonna be. It's gonna be positive. People are gonna have to live with COVID, that's a reality. You can't avoid it. Um, China's maybe doing some, somewhat of a good job at it, but reality is when they start opening up, they're not going to be able to avoid it. They have to face it. Uh, how they face it is a different thing. Um, unfortunately, we've got um, uh, not only vaccines, therapeutics are coming out. And, and COVID's going to be one, one day be like an influenza down the street. Uh, um, and it's just going to be part of our life. But we were unfortunate but also lucky enough to experience this moment and this transitional uh, uh, intense period of, of, of history where we experience this severe COVID. Um, I think there's a lot of, lot of learn, learnings for individual experiences, and that's what we just have to take with us and move forward. All right. Thank you so much for that optimistic uh, takeaway. And uh, Jim, would you please uh, contribute? What's your one-minute takeaway for us, and how do we move forward sure. positively? First, first, I'd like to thank uh, Catherine for a wonderful question, and also uh, Edgar, sir. I definitely agree with you. I spent a lot of time previously in the Philippines countryside as well, and I have tremendous respect for the industrious Filipino people in the countryside who are just intelligent and very much uh, problem solvers on the field. I have a lot of respect, sir. Um, and uh, so to answer the, the, the question, Lou, I think um, building on what Karen has said, and I very much agree with Karen in terms of the, the, the views regarding where we take ourselves post-pandemic, one of the, um, the, the key areas is this acceleration of ongoing trends, especially in the technology space that really are arguably paradigm shifts in terms of how we can organize ourselves. I mentioned decentralized autonomous organizations. Going forward, that will be, a, a, the DAOs will play a bigger role, arguably perhaps in, um, in the, organizational functioning space of just how people organize themselves as uh, as uh, as beings we also have the uh, i think you know nowadays every the, the, the term web3 regarding decentralization is all over the news whether you're reading bloomberg or wall street journal new york times right um, and you know the the facebook has re uh, rebranded itself as meta the metaverse that that happens you know with decentraland also sandbox um, so, so we, we arguably are seeing this Cambrian explosion, if I may use a biological evolutionary term, bar from Lou, this Cambrian explosion of uh, new paradigms of work and play and organization that has been accelerated, arguably. You know, these things have been going, it's almost like evolution where things are evolving, and then suddenly, as Lou, as you very, very wisely had termed, suddenly you have this disruption event and uh, and then it causes a um, a new camera explosion, accelerates evolutionary previously evolutionary trends, and we see a lot of these paradigm shifts and developments. And I'm excited. I'm just excited to see how this can take us, where this can take us. I don't have the answers to everything. I have a lot more questions than answers. To be honest, uh, no one knows for sure where this go can go, but uh, we're all arguably excited to see where this can take us and how well, amazing opportunities there are presented. Thank you for your optimism, which I share. And that Cambrian explosion was in a popular book called Wonderful Life, all the new creatures that came out. So maybe we are also going to experience a new phase of wonderful life. Edgar, could you give us a little uh, takeaway, please, from your perspective? Just quickly, we're going to have to wrap this up. Gladly, thanks, Lou, and also gladly noting that uh, Kiran, Indian, who is in uh, the U.S. or Japan, and uh, Jim, Chinese, who's in the Philippines, but who cares about uh, where we came from, you know? Uh, in the advent of townships years back, 
we have, we have that word live work play nowadays that continues but on a global uh, perspective uh, you can live anywhere uh, you can work from the field or uh, and uh, we play it's part of our being social uh, social beings and we we have no doubt that we will emerge much better humans members of humanity uh, after this test in the same manner that our ancestors uh, moved on well enough i would say after the spanish flu which was before i time I, our time i'm sure um, but to be okay we have much bet- lessons learned how to be better how to survive well now we're aware about even if the vaccine is great it doesn't make us immortal that immortality is inside us in our bodies made by that immortal being it's perfect uh, so we're perfect creation so and uh, really great to be in this room thank you well, for thank the you chance. Let, let's close on that note of perfection it doesn't get better than this by mm-hmm. definition thank you so much <laughs> gentlemen Catherine thank you for jumping in and uh, great to see you on the panel I hope to see you in person before long okay be well everyone and thank you for your great thank contribution you. thank you guys thank you thank you see you hope to see you soon Bye-bye. Have a great weekend.